Um, so uh, this is going to be hopefully a, a little bit different uh, of a talk than most of the ones here today. I think it's really important. I think it's something we all need to participate in. Um, but uh, uh, I hope during the next 50 minutes or so I don't bore you, I don't put you to sleep, because if you do, I'm going to walk up beside you and, and give you the big boo. Um, so who am I? Uh, just a real brief uh, so you know who I am and, and what I'm doing here. Um, so I work for NTT. Uh, in case you don't know what NTT is, it's the world's largest phone company. Uh, we route about 40% of the world's internet traffic. Uh, we're the largest data center provider in the world. And we happen to own, by financial footprint, the largest security uh, delivery organizations in the world. Uh, so about 1.4 billion in revenue. Uh, but that doesn't really matter here. What it, the reason I say that and the reason I talk about myself just so briefly is I need you to understand of where I'm talking from. I'm not talking uh, down to the tactical level here. I'm a strategic uh, person. And I, as part of my remit from NTT, um, is a little bit bigger than most people's because we are a global phone company. I actually have a remit to take and make security more effective in the world. Um, and I'll get to you and talk to you about why we do that and so forth as I go through this talk. But I'm really here for a whole bunch of different reasons. And for today's presentation, we have a lot of builds, so I apologize for that. But I really want to take and make you uneasy. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people will probably here will call me an idiot uh, by the time we're done. Feel free. Uh, I'm good with that. I work in security. A lot of people call me an idiot. Um, but the uh, purpose is that I'm going to babble at you for a while. I will give you my thoughts on a solution uh, to the problem that we have out there. Um, I'm going to open the floor for discussion when I'm done, assuming I've not talked for too long. And um, I want you to be feel free during this to stop and interrupt me at any time. And if you do think that I'm an idiot and we're going down the wrong path and, you know, God, get rid of this guy, please call me out uh, because I think that's important here. Part of my job is to work with people and part of my job, because I work in R&D, is to fail. And if I failed here, I need to know it fast, fail fast, and move on with our lives. Uh, so I really want uh, your participation in here. This isn't me, about me talking at you. Well, some of it is. But it's about you also talking to me uh, because that's the way I work. So let's, uh, let's go on and, and actually get to the meat of what's going on here. So in this presentation, I hope to do the following. I'm going to make you uncomfortable because I'm going to say things about us uh, that we all know, uh, but I think it's important for getting to a solution. Um, hopefully, I'll hurt our egos a bit. Um, we're in security. We're all a bit arrogant about that. We know better than you how to get in and do things, right? Let's face it, we do. Isn't it great that we can break into your system and show you that we're better than you at it? I want to take and abuse that a bit. Um, and I'm going to su hopefully suggest some things that you haven't considered about where we are in this industries and ways we as a whole can do something different. Now, we're all testers. I'm a pen tester. Uh, I do GRC. I do product implementation. I build platforms. I do lots of different things. But I don't think that's enough for what we do in security. And I don't think we as the community that is the security professionals, the people doing stuff, the people proving where the problems are and going and fixing, fixing it, is where it needs to be uh, as a general whole. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But first of all, let's set, set the stage. So you know this. We're an always connected digital world. And that world is growing really, really fast, right? All those things up there, how many, what, five, ten years ago, those things didn't exist. And they're now all major industries, right? Well, maybe social existed, I guess, you know, MySpace, but whatever. Um, the nature of our game is our digital world and the things that we're protecting in security. If you take a look at all the analyst reports and that, how big is it going to be in the next 10 years? What, 100 times the size that we have here? And I think we all know as security professionals, we suck at protecting what we already have off of the footprint that already exists. What's it going to be when all these things get to their size and scope that the analysts talk about over the next 10 years? 
And if you think about it, and you know, I'm not talking about what the solution is here yet, but thinking about setting the stage, is this is what our roadmap has really been. And I know this is generalized in that, but this is the truth, right? We have said, hey, here's our security implementation, but that's what we want, expect, and that's what everyone wants, right? Easy, transparent, I don't have to think about it, it's just there. And as we all know, because we're all in the security business, that's not the reality of out there. Can we think of one thing out there that we as the security industry trust to have done security right? And that's a question to the audience. How many people out here can think of one thing that we have trust to have done security right? Anyone? <laughs> okay, so effectively small number of answers here. I agree or disagree, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, let's face it, not much is going on there. And I've done enough tests, I've been in enough things to know that I got lifetime employment just doing pen tests, right? Uh, because we haven't done it right. And the reality is, is that we have what's called an ex expectation gap. We're here and we've expected that. But if you think about it, we actually have an exploitation gap, right? It goes from the expectation gap to what everyone really wants. And the question I have for us is we've been doing this for a long time. I've been in security, God, since 1998. How many years is that? I haven't seen anything fixed. And I don't know about you guys, but on the long term, on the way we go about doing things, yeah, we'll fix this for now, but in six months when we test again, it's the same things, different story, right? I want to know how we manage to get the expectation gap out there. Shouldn't our expectations be what our customers and what we are doing? How many of us have actually closed the expectation gap for all that security work that we've done? And let's think about this a little bit more on a global scale. Last 10 years, we have spent, as a globe, $500 billion on security. $500 billion. And according to the Gartner report that I read a couple days ago, they expect next year's spend to be $114 billion, which means the next 10 years probably be in the trillions, right? And we've managed to take and cost companies $2 trillion in that same time frame. Okay? We spent $500 million, billion dollars, and it's cost us $2 trillion, and that's the trajectory of where we're going in security. The bad guys are only getting worse. Can anyone here name one thing we have done last 20 years that have changed that trajectory? That it hasn't been increasing year to year? Great! <laughs> I actually did Y2K work. I actually helped make sure the power stayed on in the country. Um, I, power companies trade right power, and that was a, uh, a certificate-based system, and it was not Y2K compliant, and so I sat in Utah on Y2K and made sure the lights went on, and since it was only six o'clock in London, where all our clocks were set, then I went skiing, so it was great. Um, the, uh, the net net was nothing has changed uh, there. Bravo and good job to us, right? Now, I say that a bit sarcastically. We've all done a really great job, but there's a lot of things in our way. Uh, to uh, achieve that. And the question is, can we, as the people whose, whose job it is to change that, do something about it? And so that's the crux of my presentation. By the way, I put these on here deliberately small so you'd have to strain to read it, but I think that they're a little bit too small. So I'll read that, because you can't read it on my own screen. Is uh, Let's think about where did we get, get to, to get here. So I have a little quote here, and it's rather long and boring. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, there are stories of individual bank tellers, embezzlements, phone freaks manipulating computerized systems and search free long distance, and college students breaking into the Department of Defense communication systems. Oh, that was me. Anyways, uh, today cyber criminals and black cats do uh, and act like the mafia. All right? We all agree on this. Um, and if you actually think about it, I, I work in Silicon Valley. One of the great things we talk about in Silicon Valley is the digital business. What's the best example of the digital business that we have out there? Cyber criminal world. They've done crowdsourcing for years and years and years. They have resources on demand, nothing centralized. Hey, you want to buy any one of your skill sets? 50 bucks one hour, not a problem, right? 
they have all that out there. They are the ideal biz digital business out there. And they also say, I saw a news report the other day in England, the cyber uh, criminals are now bigger than the physical criminals uh, out there. They cross that threshold. It's also, what? And they're agile. And they're agile. Uh, I work in an agile world. I know wh how hard that is actually to do in real reality. And in fact, they've done it, right? Um, and the question of the day, I think, is how the hell did we get from that to that, right? What changed in the way that we did security? Well, we were actually doing security now, but, you know, what changed? Why haven't we been successful? And I'm going to actually postulate something. This will probably piss off the entire audience. But we are part of not necessarily just the solution, but also part of the problem. And I'm going to take and talk about that. I'm going to go through a couple exercises here to see if I can prove that point and then what we can do about it uh, going forward. By the way, I actually wrote that text there in a book uh, that I published. But I think it's really true. Uh, so I will. To admit that that was my own stuff here. So, I have a, a, a story to tell, and I like to say security is a bit like a wedding, right? And the where we play the role in this is really part of that story. So, if you imagine this man and uh, a husband and, and wife, they get married, beautiful ceremony, best ceremony you've ever seen, they have a lovely reception. Great, fantastic, they go on honeymoon, it's amazing. They come back to domestic life. They live just their normal domestic lives for a year or two. And then the wife's sister is getting married, right? Fantastic time, she goes upstairs, she gets all ready, she does her hair, she does all those things that women do that I just don't understand to get ready. Anyways, she comes back downstairs, and there's her husband on the lazy boy, Bud Light in one hand, Cheetos in the other, crumbs, you know watching the Blackhawks game, and I say that because I'm from Chicago, not Detroit. Um, you know, the punchline is the, is the Red Wings winning, so yeah, go ahead and boo me. Uh, anyways, anyways, it comes back, and she says, what are you doing? You've got my sister's wedding to go to. And he goes, honey, look, I understand that she's your sister and everything, but this one, you're going to have to do alone, right? You know, go there, you're going to probably have to sit with yourself with a table full of other couples. I know it'll be awkward, but you know, you'll manage. They'll probably be, you know, uh, you know, dancing and hopefully they'll do the electric slide so you don't need a partner and, and so forth. It, it'll be, you'll be lovely, you'll enjoy it, it's your sister, but you know, you're going to have to do it on your own. And she, she looks at him and says, what? What? This is my sister's wedding. He goes, look, look, honey. I want you to understand, while you're there, while you're at this wedding, I'm going to be in this lazy boy. I'm going to be watching the uh, Chicago team, uh, Blackhawks here. Hopefully they'll win. <laughs> Hopefully they'll win. I'm going to be enjoying myself immensely, just as you're enjoying yourself immense, immensely. But I want you to know, this entire wedding thing, I've done it once. I think I'm good. <laughs> Now, isn't that a bit like how we, how our customers, how we implement security, right? We know it. I got it. It's good, right? You've told me what to do. I've practiced it, right? Do we actually, as security professionals and our customers and, let's face it, the rest of the people out there, actually go about doing the things that we say we do on a rigorous basis all the time, like we say we're supposed to do. And I make you a bet, and I'll actually take and do a little test here in a bit, that we don't. And I ask the question is, is that helping or hurting our cause here? Because our cause is to be successful at our jobs and prevent cybercrime from happening. And we all know cybercrime does happen. In fact, it keeps us nice lifetime employment. But in theory, we should be putting ourselves out of a job, right? Now, the question I'm going to ask all of you is, what happens if we're ever successful in doing that? What happens to the cyber criminal element if we are, in fact, successful at our job? And it's just something for you to think about while, we're t while, we, while we talk about this here for a while. OK, that's great. And again, too small for us to read. Dear God, what have we done? So I'm going to suggest a, whoa, that's really loud. I'm going to suggest a bunch of things. 
that really feed into this, that are out there, that are in our face, that we're not addressing as the people who are the implementers, the testers, the people validating it, the users, because we are in fact users of security, right? That is actually not helping us and in fact hurting us and we're all ignoring out there. And I'm going to suggest seven things. There may be more. Maybe you don't agree with all these seven. I put these out there as the ones that I see uh, out there and then we're going to talk about what we might be able to do about it. So the first thing, and you're going to, you're going to probably call me an idiot on this, but I'm going to put it up there anyways. What are the seven things that are destroying our world? The bad guys are human. Well, that's a pretty stupid statement. Of course they're human. They're not machines in that. But the way that we treat them is not in a human manner, right? They're a thing that comes and knocks on our door and does something and repeats maybe later on, but there's a person behind it. And the reason that I say that this is important is machines do what they're programmed to. Maybe bad programming, it may be mistakes in programming, but they do what they're programmed to do. Humans don't. Humans are incentivized to succeed. Now think about that. We're in the security world, right? Our job is to prevent someone from succeeding. So what's the other side of the equation doing? They're human. They're not a machine. They're not mechanical. They have huge amounts of money at stake. Uh, the number is like $575 billion this year that they're going to steal to keep doing what they're doing. And so if we're out there doing security, what is the natural reaction? I will figure a way around you. I will do it to someone else. I will come up with another way to succeed because I am financially incentivized to do it. And in fact, they're so financially incentivized, what will happen when we succeed and cut them off of their funding by making them stop? Think about that for a second. A $500 billion corporation, if we succeed at stopping them from earning $500 billion, what are they going to do? Are they going to say, darn it, I'm just going to go get a real job? I mean, think about it. What are they going to do if we succeed at doing our job? Well, they're going to keep doing it. They're going to do it in a different way. And I'll give you the example right now. We all know that you know there's the thing going on where someone fakes an email from the CFO to the, sorry, the CEO to the CFO and says, hey, change the bank account number. And so they, sit, they pay their vendors to the wrong account and it's actually the bad guy's account and they, they walk away with the money, right? What's the next logical step of that process? Why the hell do I have to take and send a fake email? If I'm going to take and rip off, I don't know, $5 million, why don't I just go to the CFO's house and hold a gun to his head and have him just transfer the money? How far away do you think we are from that? Okay, yeah, hold it there. Hey, Kevin Cohen, say, I'm sick today. I'm not going to be in. Money's transferred. We've stolen it at the other end. Walk away, right? Yeah, it's been done. And how much more time do you think it's going to be before it becomes commonplace, right? We didn't shoot people in universities until a couple of years ago. And now everyone does it, right? I hate to use that as an example, but that's a great example of once it's okay, everyone's going to do it. And where are we in this equation in stopping people from getting to that point? Well, the fact is, is that they're human, and what we do is going to be very reactive. So let's talk about what's next up there. We have three billion people in the carbon layer of security. Does everyone know what the carbon layer is of security? That's people, right? Carbon layer, network layer, wireless layer, carbon layer, right? Okay. Uh, I invented a 15 stood. Anyways, anyways, we have 3 billion people in this world. How many people are covered by folks like us? What tiny percentage of our population in this world are actually meaningfully managed by security professionals in some way, shape, or form? What, 10%, 20%, maybe? So what's the remaining, whatever percent that is, to the cyber crime community? I'm sorry, what? Ah, I would dispute that. I would call it the testing ground. So yes, they may not be enough, not enough money to bother, but where is the cyber crime's biggest investment? 
Where do they spend the money? It's not in attacking you. It's in figuring out how to attack you successfully. Right? And then replicate it a hundred times. If you guys are doing your jobs, right, and we're preventing it, we put up firewalls, we have WAFs, we have security policies, we have compliance, we have two-factor authentication, you name all the things that we do, where do we take and test the men? The people who are less protected, right? And all the way down to the ignorant masses that are out there. That's the breeding ground for us. We can't see it. We have no visibility into it. But yet, that is the testing ground for breaking into where the real money is. And uh, being in the threat intelligence space that I am, I happen to know that there's a lot of money to be made on the people who don't have any money. But that's another story. Um, so I would say that that is the second part of our problem. We are doing nothing for the vast majority of the people out there. Question or raising your hand? Okay, so that's number, number uh, the next one there, oh, number, number six. So the next one, and it goes along the same thing is, we're all great for whatever we do in security, but most security is DIY, right? Do it yourself. What is the way that we go about doing it? Does someone who actually knows what they're doing implement most of the security in the world? And how many people have actually tested things to actually know that even the people who do know what they're doing are you know, entirely perfect in their process, right? So if most security is DIY, and I apparently went two slides there, Sorry, I don't know why my transitions went bad, but okay, we'll go on to the next one. Um, is um, we also don't share. Now, I've, I'll tell you the story here in a little bit, but I'm a big proponent of sharing what the hell happened to me so it can prevent it from happening to you. How many of us share out that information or even have the political will in our customers, in our own organizations, for ourselves, to actually share what happened to us so that it doesn't happen to someone else. What's the percentage there? Is it in the single digits? Is it less? I do threat intelligence. I, I pull in millions and millions and millions of records a day. I can tell you that's a tiny fraction of what I can actually see on my networks. 20,000 a second per CNC node. Um, the net is we don't share it. Let's think about the other side of the community. What is happening on, in the bad guy's world, right? They share everything for a price, but they share everything. If you need to know a new exploit, $5,000 maintenance included, right? Um, if you need to take and know how to get into a customer system after I'm done exploiting it, fine. I'll take and provide that information probably for free. But we on the other side, we don't say, I've been attacked. This is what they did to me. Here's what I did to prevent it. How are we supposed to do it given the Spartan information that's available from preventing it, right? How many actual breach notifications occur versus the number of actual breaches that occur? I mean, let's face it. How many of you have run pen tests and it's all over the place and you know you're not the first person there? But there's nothing that is done about it. There's no investigation of what may have happened. We, we don't know, right? The reality is there is no sharing in this community. Now, I will also say that we are changing on that front, and I'll talk about that here a, a little bit later. So apparently I had this in the wrong order, but that's okay. DIY, that's next, fine, okay. Next one is... Uh, oh, picky, picky, picky. <laughs> Let me make sure the right one's up there, huh? There is no central reference for security. Can any person here, and I'm a GRC person as much as I'm a pen tester here, tell me what standard I follow for security? Anyone? Okay, just baseline, passwords. Anyone can tell me what the standard is to do Passwords, the most common security control we have in the world. Anyone? Anyone? No, which one to follow? What's our reference? What's our reference? NIST, ISO, Japanese National Standards, PCI. What's our reference? Some guy who wrote it on his blog, what's our reference? And that's the most common thing that we do. 
By the way, I'm trying to get rid of passwords, so if you want to see something, go visit the Milagro project at Apache. Another story. Anyways, we have no central reference for this, and we all have very complicated standards. I was a, a PCI assessor. All 232 controls. God, what a thing to implement. Um, uh, you know, I've done ISO. Oh, God. I've done our own internal ones, which are worse. Oh, Japanese, thank you. Uh, but the, the net net is we don't have it. How are we actually supposed to have those 80% of people out there that have no security out there do anything? If you guys were, any of you were at the uh, PC, uh, at Black Hat two years ago and went to the keynote presentation, there's a great speech there that talked about someone trying to, uh, a, a butcher was breached. A single small business owner had an old credit card PC in the back corner for 10 years. It was breached. Hundreds of transactions were lost, so they made him go through an audit. And trying to explain to some guy whose job is to chop up animals how to do PCI because his systems were breached. I mean, think about that for a second. He does have a butcher knife. That doesn't help you if you're 5,000 miles away, but you know, that's the reality of it. We don't have a reference, right? Or even a simple reference. Here's the 10 things you need to do in all cases. And can we even write that? I think we probably could write at least something that people could have as a standard. Um, or a reference. Forget a standard, just as a reference. Number two. Almost no one is arrested. I counted it up last year, and I don't know if the number is still there. Less than 500 people in the history of cybercrime have been arrested, starting at Kevin Mitnick. Okay, 500 people. Do you know how many people I am tracking, or maybe people, may not, let's, let's assume it's people, that I am tracking my threat intelligence network that are performing cybercrime right now? I went and I looked last night, 1.2 million. Do we ever facilitate the arrest of the people that is our problem? If you're not going to get arrested and you make stupid amounts of money and nothing's going to happen to you, why would you ever stop doing it? Now, of course, we don't want them to stop because we make lots of money as professionals doing it and we sell lots of product, but the reality is, is we don't, as a society, want these things to be happening Yet, we're not doing any real thing about it. I was at RSA this year. I'm like, there's 40,000 people here. There's 5,000 vendors and that. Not a single one of them has stopped the problem. Stopped being prevented from ever happening again, arrested a person, done anything. No one has. So from a personal note, I actually have people on my staff who are connected to law enforcement. I'm actually trying to do something about it as an international telco. But even that, it's, it's, it's a thing. But let's think about it. What have we ever done? What have you done in your businesses or you as a person to ever help facilitate that? Unless the FBI calls you and says, I need some records, what have you ever done? Question. Anyone? Anyone done anything? Hey, one. Great. What? 100 people in this room? Okay, 1%. That's better than zero, so awesome. Awesome. Okay. And then the final one. And the final one, and hopefully you don't hate me for this one, it's the title of the, the thing itself, we don't, won't, and can't say no. We as a security community are supposed to be the gatekeepers for a lot of this stuff. And feature and function first, we say, no, that's bad. But at the same time, we have a real hard time saying, don't do that, right? And sometimes we succeed. I won't, sometimes we succeed. But on a general case, how often do we have to say, oh, it's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll find a way to make it work, right? And I think that that is really a facilitator for the bad guys succeeding. We've given them their openings and they've exploited it. And they know that we're gonna have openings that we give them in the future and they're gonna exploit those too because, God, I can't do the, holistic part of the job that I say I want to do and I can't get the political will behind me to actually achieve that and let's face it if I go into a, cu a customer and I do that they have the same problems uh, I don't know how many people have done a pen test and sorry I can't remediate so it's it's a problem I just can't fix that right 
<sighs> Anyways, OK. So, great. I'm going to do a little, little exercise here, right? And it's on the concept of no means no. Now, I have two kids. Um, my youngest, uh, Will, uh, my wife and I had uh, 11 years ago. Great. My second one was adopted. And I say was adopted, not is adopted. Adoption is a process. It has a beginning and an end. Someone is not adopted forever. Adoption is the name of the process. So he is not an adopted son. He is my son. So I have to say that as an adoptive parent. Right. Okay. Having said that and having my lanyard come off here, I, one of the things that they taught us in adoption class, and yes, you have to go to class, uh, because he was from China, specifically Taiwan, uh, is uh, he's not Caucasian. I'm Caucasian, right? My wife's Caucasian. He's not. That means we have a transracial adoption. And part of that, they sat us in a room and wanted to teach us about racism. Because being Caucasian, I don't understand it. And I thought I did. My best friends growing up were, you name it, across the racial boundaries. And because they were my best friends, I got whitewashed with some of, uh, some of what they got. And I thought I knew what the hell I was doing. And trust me, I don't. And to this day, I don't. So for all of you people who've experienced it, I don't understand it, but I know it's, I know it's a thing. So what they did is they put us in the room, and they said, we want to teach you that everyone is a racist. And well, I said, God, no, I'm not. Look, I did this, I did that, that can't possibly be. By the end of the exercise, every single person in the room was standing. And basically what they did is they put things up on the screen and said, have you ever? And of those things, Eventually, everyone had done it, and it was a culturally ingrained thing that our parents taught us, that we did, uh, we learned on the news, whatever, and it was racist to a degree. Now, I'm not going to take and teach us about racism here, but I'm going to teach us about security for a second. So what I'm going to do on this slide is I'm going to put up quotes, things that I have said in the past at various points in time, trying to do security right, and if you have ever said something like that, I want you to stand up. And let's see how good we are about saying no in this process here. So let's start off. It's a medium vulnerability. We'll deprioritize. How many people have, have deprioritized remediating a medium pro priority? And if no one stands up, you're all lying. <laughs> right? We'll run the software even if the vendor can't patch. How many of you guys have done that, right? Yeah, everyone's looking down at their feet. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not suggesting otherwise. I'm suggesting we can't say no. And I'm not defending it or saying it, but we can't say no. By the way, you notice I'm standing because I've said all these things at the thing. You're a senior executive. Of course you can. How many people have said that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, you don't have to stand up. <laughs> uh, we know that while I get through here, you're right, nine character passwords are too complex to remember. Uh, it's too late to fix. We'll just push it out. Sure, the contractors can come through the air gap so they don't have to come on site. I'll let the developer have access. That's a great one. And last one, to every firewall in the world. Sure, you could have an exception to the ACL to see if your XYZ works. And how many people have actually gone back and removed that over time, too? Let's, let's face it. That's, that's the reality there. And that is, I'm not condemning us for that. That's the reality of the situation. We have the pressures on there. But the reality is, is for whatever reason, we can't say no the way that we want to in this field. And it's our job to say no, isn't it? It's our job to disallow things from happening. Security is not about sharing. Security is not about letting the network go where it needs to go. Security is about saying you can't connect, you can't have this, you can't do that. But yet, our situation is, is that we have to allow that to happen. Now, isn't that facilitating the exact opposite thing that we want it to happen? There's a million two people out there that want to get into your system. And you just said, oh, well, it's okay, whatever. And we all know as pen testers, at least the pen testers in the room, that's the way we break in, right? Yeah, okay. 
So, I know you can't read that, but what am I suggesting is we, the information security community, are at least partially responsible for facilitating the problem, right? If you go back to my very first point, they are human. Every time we do something and we do something to the lack of completeness, what does that do? That incentivizes them to find the way around it. I was at the world's largest insurance company doing a pen test from their internal environment to see how many ways we could, in fact, break in, 19. Um, and during that process, there was a virus outbreak. Um, it was a really nice root kit, and it hit 19 people in the environment. Can you guess what three letters started, or at least the first of those three letters, started each and every one of those machines? And the reason that they didn't have any protection on their machine was it interferes and they passed around the USB stick with that particular malware on it amongst themselves. Okay, so we know that that's facilitating the problem, right? Uh, by the way, that was not one of the 19 ways I broke in. That just happened to be there while I was there. So, or so I say. Now, I... I Really, They're, they had the same password for every database. Name of the company won. Um, yeah, including, including the Federal Reserve database. Anyways, um, so anyways, having said that is, I also believe we are the only people that can solve the problem. That three billion people that are out there, they're not going to help us here. That's not their job, that's not their interest, and they don't care. Um, the people that are our customers and our clients and that are our organizations, they do care, but they're looking to us to take and solve the problem. And so we, I believe, need to go beyond what we're doing as a community to take and solve that problem. And we can only do it as a community, not as individuals. So I have an idea. And eh, we'll see how, that, how the idea flies, but... Let's go back two years and revisit number five up there. Number five there, which is out of order, said we don't share. I sat with the CTO of a large security company. They're known for their antivirus, firewall, SIM products, and stuff like that. Uh, sorry, the CTO. And he said, when I said, hi, I have threat intelligence, I'd like to take and share our information, let you know what's happening to mine, you know yours, we'll anonymize it, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that way we can take and better protect both of our customer sets. You're at the desktop, I'm at the network, perfect marriage. And he said to me, I'm oh, sorry, I said to him, and he said to me, never going to happen, our data is our differentiator. Our data is so unique that we can't possibly give it away because then we'll never be able to sell a product uh, again. And I looked at him and I said, well, isn't your technology unique? The data is just simply supporting? He said, no, our data is unique. So let's talk about today. Yeah, I'm sharing data with them. Uh, and for other vendors who said the same thing, uh, they're all names you know, probably names you use, probably names you sell, and maybe... Some vulnerabilities were found in their management products recently, but that's, that's another story. Anyways, and the reason for that is I came to things like this and I said, we need to share. And enough people came to the table and said, we need to share. Now, I'm not the only one that's saying this. I'm not going to claim that I'm the only one doing this. This is part of a much wider uh, thing out there. But it take, and it's changing the industry. Now, it's going to take probably 10 years to get to the point where we need to get to, but at least it's starting. And now that Bluecoat was acquired by Symantec, I'm going to get their data too. Anyways, the net net is, it's happening there. And that was something that was impossible. We can't share. It's dangerous for us to share, Like right? No one shares information. It's happening. So I believe that things are possible. So what if we could do something about all those other things out there that I talked about? How would that change our world? And I have a question for, for the audience here. How do you think that that would change our world if those seven things, I'm sure that's not all of them, but let's just talk about those seven things, changed to be positives instead of negatives, like that I portray, portrayed them to be. That we did those things, that our three billion users out there in the world weren't a liability. What if 
it wasn't security that's just DIY for many, many cases. What if we actually shared what happened to us so that other people could take and prevent it from happening to them? How would our world change? And I know that's a fairly tall order, but I work for a telco and I've been told to solve fairly tall orders, so you know I'm all good with that. So what I've done is I've actually created a manifesto. I'm not good at manifestos, so I apologize for that. But I've created a manifesto that says, what are the things that we as a collective whole could do to take and solve this? And I'm going to pull a quote from the Game of Thrones. I don't know how many people here watch it. Probably we're all in the technology industry, so everyone. But uh, in the most recent seasons, we had this guy called the High Sparrow. He was, well, many things, but he had a quote, and I really believe that quote's true, and we live in a democracy, so I know that it, in fact, works. As an individual, I am powerless, but as a community, we can topple an empire, right? And I think that's the place we have to go. And for the things that I'm talking about here is I'm suggesting, and you guys may say I'm an idiot, like I said that you would at the very beginning here, but if we did those things and we did them to completion, it's the possibility for us to change that trajectory because nothing else we have done has changed that trajectory. Right? Firewalls are our magic bullet. It's going to change the trajectory of, of, of bad guys, except on port 80 and 443, but that's not another story. Um, you know, I'm going to put in an IDS. It'll tell me everything that they're doing, yeah, except it produces too many logs, and we need another thing called a SIM to actually read it and interpret it, which, of course, the output of which we won't actually pay attention to. Um, the, uh, you know, and on and on and on and on and on. In fact, AV, let's th think of it, antivirus was the first magic bullet. I got my first virus in 1989, and oh my god, AV is going to protect me from all these things. Yeah, yeah there's a reason to run a Mac now. Anyways. Um, so let's, let's think about that for a second. What could that possibly be? And again, that's the things that I thought of. And I might not be right, but I think those are starting points. And you say, well, that's all difficult and hard to achieve. And then I say, yes, but in 1992, when I first started working, people smoked at their desk. They smoked at their desk. In fact, I own a partner's desk from Booz Allen Hamilton, where I worked, that has cigarette burn marks in it from him smoking it in the office, Steve Griffiths. Anyways, it's, by the way, a really nice desk. By the way, if we fast forward to today, people said, no, we don't want this. And for all you smokers, where do we have to smoke? We have to go outside in the, especially here in the northern states, where it's cold and wet and icky to do my smoking. And you know what? It's in other countries, too, right? In Japan, they're smoking outside. In England, we're outside the pub. It's changing. And those things can change the world that should never have changed. 25% of the world smokes. They should stop that shit. But they didn't, right? I also think this is the way that we go about it. And we have to do it as a community. We can't do it as individuals, because as individuals, it's not going to work for us. So if you take a look at that, we have to start viewing our adversaries there as humans, right? What is their natural progression? They're in it for the money, right? Why do it if it's not for the money? Well, maybe the fun, the games of political activism, but really, it's in it for the money, right? Let's start treating them as people that are in it for the money that everything we do, they're going to be reactive to. Um, you know, enforce a simple common baseline. What is our password standard? I'll give you the first one we can start on. Actually, get rid of passwords, but that's another story. Um, share. What the hell happened to us? It's only scary until everyone starts doing it. And if everyone's scary, it's, it's actually pretty good. In fact, I'm a big proponent of getting rid of network security entirely. Let's move it all down to the device. Let's do it at the device level. Let's not do it at the network. The network is blinding us to solving problems inside our facilities. Because the network's taking care of it. It does it for many instead of for the one. Um, move away by security by happenstance. The term best practice means it's optional, right? Best practice means it's optional. Hey, they're doing it, but it's best practice. It isn't a required practice or whatever you want to call it, right, out there. Let's actually get central references that are technology folk. And I said grandmothers. It really should be my mother-in-law. My grandmother's dead. She can't read anything. But my mother-in-law can actually do. And, you know, publish mechanisms to assist having the bad guys arrested. Wouldn't it be great 
If we could give the information to actually have these guys removed from our problem. Maybe that creates a worse problem, I don't know, but we haven't tried it. Right? We have no mechanism for doing that. And then lastly, and the title of the entire thing is, stop accepting compromise on security. And we have to do it as a universal thing. And if we did it as a universal guideline out there, we are then supported when people say, no, 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 I want to, uh, sorry, I have to say no, it's a universal guideline. Right? We don't have that. And that's the reason I go back to that central reference point. We have nothing to say, this is the way you do it. And so no one believes you. Right? You have to bring in external pen testers because your internal security people can't be trusted. Really? Really? Um, which, by the way, is good for business, but that's beside the point. You know, let's take and change how we do this. And by the way, if you want a copy of this, I'm happy to give it to you so you don't have to write it down. But, um, so that's it. And how much time do I have here? Oh, look at that. I got five minutes. I got five minutes. So, no. <laughs> Pack up. Then you'll like read, read my words and say things about them. Yeah. Yeah. I disagree with that. I disagree with that because I'm doing it. I went from zero to millions on things, and I'm not saying for everything, but yes, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Right, and I will, I will agree with you there. I will agree. Oh, did I misspell it? Oh my god, I misspelled it. I'm an idiot. <laughs> well, but let's, I agree with that 100% because I have a global remit, so I have unfortunately this problem el elsewhere. But yeah, we have problems in Russia, we have problems in China, but does that obviate the need for us to get rid of problems in the United States or in England or whatever? Yeah. Uh, uh, really? Because I did it three times today. Um, <laughs> so I agree. And these are propositions. These aren't definitive statements. And I'm not saying that every one of these is perfect. But change it. Change it to make it work. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I'm not refuting anything you said, by the way. I agree completely. Is These are not set in stone. These are ideas. Let's talk about them as a community. Let's decide what we want to do about them. Let's throw some away. I'm fail fast. I'm, a, I'm in an agile environment. Throw it away. I don't care. I'm sorry, with who? No, but I've talked with the FBI and the Australians. So... <laughs> Okay. 
So, by the way, for that particular one is actually on staff. I actually have people who are former Secret Service, people who are, in fact, the current head of uh, cybercrime in Australia. So we, as an organization, are ruffling how to take and do this. Uh, we like to take and publish things out there to the community. So we're trying to find a way to do it with the people we have on staff who are part of that community. So as a concept, you know, I also believe in doing things locally as well as globally. I put this out to you, but that's because many of these things we're trying to do some degree ourselves. I can't solve everything in the world, but I can certainly try down the path and find out what works. So, uh, by the way, and the reason I say throw out passwords is I have an alternative that may be better, but I also recognize that writing a password uh, function is about 10 lines of code. So, yeah. Uh, writing it well is about 1,000. So, yeah. <laughs> Other questions, comments, and or derogatory remarks? <laughs> no, no, no. Th that's the way I end all my presentations. And it's actually written two slides from now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's the point that I'm making is that us realistically saying no is a very high, high task. And the reason I said is we need a reference out there is because you have nothing to back you up, right? There's political will, there's commercial will, there's all thousands of things that we have out there that disallow us from saying no. But if we have something greater than ourselves that says for these things you should say no, you begin to form an ability to do that. Now, will it help you immediately? Probably not. But as those sort of things are out there, they tend to be references. The more that they're references, the more power you have to use them as references and so forth. There is nothing in a particular environment for me to take and override your CEO's uh, uh, requirement. But the CEO is responsible to a board. Board's responsible for reading things and so forth, and that's where I've been successful in doing things. Yes? I think you just touched on it then. You literally said, will this change things immediately? No. no. I think you touched and I think maybe that on one of your top seven, yeah. short-term thinking. Ah, good point. Good short point. Good. Session of short -term thinking yep. For the next quarter, the next year, yep. the next product release. You know, and, yeah. And we really, really fall into that track a lot. Yeah, and we, we do as a community. So I don't know how I'm doing on time here. OK, so people want to move. There are people here to kick me out. So anything else from the floor? You're all talking, so that means I've lost you anyway. So <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate your time. <laughs>